my goal is to give everybody here a crash course in addiction neuroscience. I want everyone today to have a sense of what it's like when I talk to a person. And it's a very peculiar experience. By the time you're done, you'll think, oh, wow, that must be weird to be him. <laughs> because when I meet a person, I uh, use two hands. One of the things, I did some research on LifeRing uh, before I prepared this uh, presentation. One of the things at the end of a LifeRing talk is everybody claps, right? Isn't that one of the nice things, you know, celebratory thing? It's lovely. Um, so when I tell patients how I uh, see their situation, I, I mention uh, uh, two ways. And I'm going to use two hands as a metaphor. I'm going to give a lot of metaphors today because it's going to help your recovery. It's going to help you understand addiction. It's going to help you understand the addiction of a family member if you understand how this thing between your ears works. The more you understand how this thing between your ears works, the better you're going to roll through your recovery and understand other people. That's 2016 neuroscience. It's going to be 2026 neuroscience. One of the nice things about a secular organization is I can talk about addiction with no reference to supernatural concepts. Don't need any. I can talk about neuroscience, biology. It's kind of nice. I can't talk about things like the afterlife, and, with, with, but I can talk about addiction without any reference to supernatural concepts because we're a species who have this collection of cells between our ears that gets hooked by molecules and does funny stuff. How's that for a definition of addiction? <laughs> based in, it's based in biology. So when I talk to a person, what's your name? Dan. Dan. When I talk to Dan, say he comes into lasting recovery or anywhere. Actually, let's say he comes into lasting recovery because I don't do this when I talk to people in public. When he comes into lasting recovery, I'm thinking about Dan as a person and people and by the way, I'm, if I use the term addict, slap my hand, I like people terms, a person with a substance use disorder. If he's a person with a substance use disorder, I'm going to think of him as a person who has a mom and a dad and has a family and has had some hard times and may have some goals and can feel pain like I do. He's a person. But here's the weird part. Here's what you're going to walk out of here understanding better today. He's also an evolved organism that has a specific kind of biology that, that I've spent the last 25 years of my life obsessively learning about. And that perspective of him as a biological organism is going to influence how I think about him. It's going to ch and when I'm talking to someone with a substance use disorder, that understanding, which I hope mine is a little better than all of yours because that's what I do for a living. That understanding is going to influence the treatments I'm going to recommend and how I think about his disorder and how I think about his choices, et cetera, et cetera. How could it not? If I'm an architect, which I'm not, I'm looking at this room and thinking, oh, they did, they, you know, they did this thing with the, 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 okay? So the other hand, on one hand, although I'm a scientist and think of myself as such, I'm a human being like everybody. I have a mom and a dad and feel pain and all that good stuff. But then on the other hand, like I said, I've been obsessively interested in, in biology and more specifically brain biology for the last 25 years. And I'm a big believer in education and neuroscience as taking massive leaps forward in our understanding of addiction. There's some downsides to it, but we'll get to that. So as we get started, here's our journey with Sisyphus. Sisyphus is this guy, his punishment was, he got in great shape with the punishment, right? That's not bad. <laughs> Um, but addiction is a hard problem. Humans have some easy problems. Humans have some hard problems. Do you have a skin tag? It's an easy problem. I clip it off, you're done. It's not a recurrent problem. Addiction is a hard problem. Kills tons of people, wrecks lives, take moms away from kids. It's a real hard problem. I don't think anybody debates that. Anybody believe addiction is an easy problem? In any audience, anywhere, I want them to call me or email me or tell me how easy it is. It's a hard problem, no matter which end of it you're on. This is Rene Descartes. You can change his last name into a kind of thinking called Cartesian dualism. That's a fancy word. But what it means is there's like two kinds of stuff. Uh, Rene Descartes wanted to figure out how the world worked. So he went into a dark room and he sat there and there was no input because he wanted to know like, how this deal works. And what he realized is, if you cut everything else off, there's still this thinking going on. And he said, cogitory goes some, I think, therefore I am. So there's two kinds of things in Descartes' world. There's like my mind, which, which is the, and then there's the rest of the stuff. But that, that 
perspective is actually wrong. I'm going to tell you why. And this gets kind of a little heady. So he, that was wrong. Has anybody heard? <laughs> Who's heard the statement, addiction is a brain disorder? Please, every, if your hand doesn't go up, then you, that, you know, because this has been said since 1976 when Leshner said, addiction is a brain disorder. When I started this talk, when you actually dive into some questions, I, don't act, I didn't actually really understand what that means. What does it mean that addiction is a brain disorder? That I can do a liver transplant, or a kidney transplant, or a toe transplant. I don't know why you do that. <laughs> and, and, and the addiction stays with the brain. But if I could do a brain transplant, and we probably never will for reasons beyond this talk, the addiction would go with the brain. I promise. That's the way the world works. So I hope everybody leaves today with, a real, uh, with some tools for thinking about this idea that addiction is a brain disorder. Addi rocks don't get addiction. Rats do. Rats have brains, rocks don't. Addiction's a brain disorder. Now, black and white photography is interesting. You know, it's called black and white photography. And you can do some spectacular things with black and white photography. But if you actually uh, you know, drill down into black and white photography, there's a lot of gray here. And so even things that are black and white have some gray in between. But if we take the brain and we push it through a prism, I want to talk about the rain, uh, uh, some rainbow concepts. Because as Jeff said, it's impossible that in 2020 and in 2030, you know, uh, Sweden's a very secular country, that, the, that a coherent discussion about addiction is going to be around supernatural concepts, like God. That's just impo it's, it's not conceivable that in an increasingly secular world, that that's going to be a turning point for a rational discussion about this brain disorder. So we're going to talk about some colors in the brain. Because when you say addiction is a brain disorder, that's kind of a black and white statement. Someone else could say, no, it's not. right? So it's either is or it isn't. That's a black and white statement. I'm going to talk about, uh, hopefully give you some tools to think about how to make sense of the fact that addiction is a brain disorder. So here's seven tools for thinking like a shrink. Now when I'm talking about tools, we actually have cognitive tools. Words are cognitive tools. They help you wrap your, idea, your mind around an idea. It's a very powerful thing, cognitive tool. So, the, the, so I'm going to give these tools names. I'm going to repeat them three times, and hopefully you'll walk out remembering one thing I said. The first tool I call one hand clapping. Second, there's an issue of levels and complexity. Third, your brain is like an iceberg. Fourth, your brain is made of modules and circuits. Fifth, your brain is both plastic, that means malleable, and static, that means you have memory. Fourth, or excuse me, sixth, we're all dogs. And I'm going to tell you what that means. If there's any dog lovers, this is going to make you smile. This is, I love dogs because they're a great analogy for teaching us about human mammals. And seventh, boy, that turned out terrible. I should pick a better font next time. You know, this is Roy G. Biv if you're paying attention, if you're a rainbow person. That's indigo, but it turns out awful. So that says models and language matter. We have brains where the way we use words is a big deal. It really influences how we understand things. That's why calling someone an addict feels different than if I say you're a person with a substance use disorder. They feel different. If we call torture enhanced interrogation, it feels different. <laughs> right? George Orwell talked about the fact that governments co-opt words to change the way that people think in the world. What's the point of having a coherent, rational model of addiction? What would the point be? My point would be not to be right, although I like being right. This kind of feels good, right? My point is that I think that a coherent, rational understanding of addiction that's based in science can help ease suffering from this awful, destructive disorder. And I'd suggest that some models that don't do this create suffering. OK, so addiction is a brain disease. BDMA is not a new designer drug. This is an acronym for the Brain Disease Model of Addiction. This is the predominant model of addiction for most scientists on the planet today. Brain Disease Model of Addiction. You as 2016 educated people. Should, uh, could, should have an idea about addictions of brain disease. Diabetes is an insulin disease. This is not uh, far-reaching neuroscience. And psychiatrists are brain doctors and treat brain diseases. And so when I approach a person, of course, I have this in mind. Addiction neuroscience says that when you voluntarily take certain drugs, certain molecules, 
they change your brain and they change your mind. That's just a little model for thinking about that. Most, um, uh, almost every addictive molecule has been shown to change your brain and to change your mind. Very powerful. Now, why should you, why should you want to understand how the brain works? Here's one reason. And why should you want to think like a shrink? In a 2016 survey, these are drug use disorders, that's DUD. They're very common. And when you talk about comorbidity, there were significant associations with depression, dysthymia, bipolar, PTSD, and PDs or personality disorders. So a significant number of people with drug use disorders have other problems, and these are brain-based problems. This is a Dutch survey saying the same thing. These, anybody with a substance use disorder, a third, had schizophrenia, uh, excuse me, a third had schizophrenia, bipolar, depression, anxiety, and other kinds of problems. So that's one reason psychiatrists are important in the treatment of addiction. But here's another reason. So this looks like a, 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 a good saying, peace comes from within, don't seek it without. It, but you know, I like the expression, if you see Buddha in the street, shoot him. I think he, someone wise said that. So Buddha was wrong about this, I'll tell you why. <laughs> if you have severe treatment resistant schizophrenia, Peace may come from an antipsychotic. For some of my patients with severe treatment resistant depression, peace does come from Nardal, an antidepressant. So it's not accurate that all human misery comes from within. That's just not accurate in my world. Now, of course, addiction is the opposite problem that you do an excessive look outside. So some of these sayings, here's another reason you need to think like a shrink. One of the substance use disorders, opiate dependence. Experts say medication-assisted treatment is the treatment of choice. Period, end of story, not explore all the options. That's what's recommended, some kind of medication-assisted treatment. Because if you look at the slide, and this is retention in treatment, the patients on buprenorphine, this is not a sales talk for buprenorphine, I'm trying to talk about science. Patients on buprenorphine stayed in treatment, and I, 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 this curve comes into my mind when I see somebody with opiate dependence. Patients without medication, their time in treatment is whoop, and they're gone. And I guarantee when they drop out of treatment, it's not to go to some non-12-step based program. No, that's not what's happening when people fall out of treatment. So in order to understand this graph, which is the reality for opiate use disorders, you have to understand the brain. To understand this study, you have to understand the brain. Ultra-low dose buprenorphine treats suicidal ideation. How is it possible that as a psychiatrist, I may be thinking about using buprenorphine to treat depression? You're gonna understand that later, in, uh, later today. How does naltrexone reduce drinking in teenagers? Naltrexone blocks opiates in the brain. How does that work? You're gonna know by the end of our talk. That's another medication. And, and the, they studied heroin, and they showed that heroin helps people with emotional pain. That's no surprise to anybody. A, a speaker later today struggled with, uh, uh, with this for a long time. So to make sense of data like this, you have to understand how the brain works. God says, oh, that's what these, those are for. You never knew what halos were for, but actually. <laughs> but, this is, but this is to remind me, in 2020, you may go to a treatment program and be offered this. What is that halo? What is that thing? That's a TMS coil. So in 2020, it's possible that if your sons or daughters are going to treatment, I may, I may say that we can modify their brain with TMS and that can help them. It'll probably look more like this, but how would that work if this is not a biological disorder? Because TMS changes the biology of the brain. It's early. How do, how do you make sense of this? that patients who had a stroke and this part of their brain called the insula died, see the red picture? Patients in the hospital where that part of their brain died quit smoking like that. How does that make sense if addiction is not a brain disorder? Or is that where God lives? I don't know. <laughs> and then everybody has to make sense of this. This is very recent data from Ken Kendler who's done these tremendous twin studies. Just focus on the black. How do you make sense of the genetic basis of addiction if it's a supernatural disorder? The genetic basis of addiction is because genes pass on molecules that affect the brain. Your risk for drug abuse was increased by 1.5 to 2.5 times if there was a biological parent. Didn't matter where you grew up. So all of these data help us think about addiction as a brain disorder. Let's talk about one hand clapping. In 2016, this is Cognitive Tool 1, in 2016, our best understanding, my best understanding, and I'll have an off-counter debate with anybody who wants to go uh, uh, on about this. 
is all of our thoughts and all of our feelings and all of our wants and all of our needs and all of our hopes and all of our dreams come from the activity that sells between your ears. That's the way the world works as I understand it. That's why when someone has Alzheimer's and their brain gets chewed up with these awful plaques and tangles, the person disappears, don't they? Slowly, but they do. That's why someone who has a severe stroke, you can look in their eyes and say they're gone or some part of them is gone. Now, this is a really weird thing. One hand clapping is, you know, we clap with two hands, so this organ between my ears can be seen in two ways. It's A, this organ made of cells, like my finger and my pinky and my toe, and it runs on chemistry and electricity. And on the other hand, and this is the, one of the most dramatic modern mysteries, I don't have an answer to it. These cells between our ears make thoughts and feelings and dreams and pictures and poems, and it's, it's crazy. I don't know how it works. But the smartest people I know that study this thing say that it's, that it's parts of the same thing. Parts of the same thing. That's why I can play with your mind. I can change the way your mind works by chemistry and electricity and hormones and all that. Anybody who's been through menopause knows this very well, right? Or anybody who has gone through uh, uh, puberty. Anybody gone through puberty? You think chemistry changes the way your brain works? You bet it does. And so the, the reality of our existence, as I understand it, is that our conscious experience is created by the activity in an organ called the brain. That's step one in thinking like a brain scientist. It's a weird big leap, but it starts there. We're going to get into part two now. That's tool number one. Tool two is from about 10,000 feet. If I want to, so let's say I believe what I just said, which I do that all of your thoughts and feelings and all that is about this organ between your ears. I'm really interested in how that thing between your ears works now, right? So we've spent a lot of energy and time trying to figure out how this thing between your ears works. And guess what? It's really complicated. That's why when you ask me any question about the brain when we're done, I'm going to take a deep breath and say, it's really complicated. That doesn't mean it's not true, it's just really complicated. So from how we understand the brain, everybody's uh, probably heard this analogy. You know, if you blindfold a bunch of people and give them an elephant, they're going to touch different things, and somebody's going to say it's a spear, it's a fan, it's a wall, it's a rope. And so I could look at the brain, and I will, and say, the brain's a really social organ. That's why meetings matter. If you ask me why uh, peer support makes a difference as a scientist, it's because humans are a social species. Period, end of story, there's other parts to it. You can look at the brain as a chemical organ. That's why drugs change the brain, and that's why we treat some brain disorders with chemicals. You can look at the brain as a developmental organ. That's why when 18-year-olds use drugs, it's much worse than when a 25-year-old does, because the brain's this developing organ. So there's a lot of ways to understand the brain. And the tool, too, is that when you think about the brain, you're going to have to expand this accordion of your mind to think at terms of different levels. Let me tell you what this means. This means that, where did, who, where did, you left your chair. You were like my stand-in volunteer Sorry. guy. No, but you, I, you, you, man, you dissed me, man. How do you like that? We're a spe see, what I feel, I feel like wronged. I'm teasing you, right? No, I did have a tiny bit of hurt there. I'm, I'm teasing Teasing you. Can I still use you even though you're up there? Sure. Okay. So what, when I think about the levels of your brain, think about your brain in terms of levels, I may think about your DNA because your mom and your dad and your uncle all had addictive disorders. So I got to think about the way that addictive disorders are passed on, which is DNA. I may think in terms of synapses. Synapses obviously is where I work with my serotonin and my Prozac and my uh, naltrexone. I may say, hey, you sound like a guy who may benefit from something that blocks opiates. I may think about you in terms of circuits. Circuits are like the reward circuit and the stress circuit. And I may say, when you're recovering from alcohol, your stress circuit is hot and bothered for weeks. So I'm going to give, I'm going to recommend this medication because I know that about addiction. That's a circuit level understanding. And then, at the, at, and then ultimately this all feeds up to the brain, but I may even go a level up from that because an individual person is one level, but then let's say we talk about your relationships. So you'll see this lady in gray has different relationships, right? I may think about how your brain is affected by your tough relationship at home. I think about that as a, as a brain biologist. I may think about the fact your, your role as a dad. 
I may think about the fact that you've got caregiving responsibilities. And I may think about you as, as a part of this big world with your career or your workplace or things. So a brain-based level of understanding doesn't mean that I don't take other factors into account. You got to just think in terms of levels and we're going to try to address all of those. But I can address all of those when I'm still thinking about the brain because bad relationships, guess what we know about bad relationships? They create toxic chemistry for the brain and body. We know that. There's, there's no magic. They create toxic chemistry for the brain and body. So as a, a brain scientist, I'm still thinking about us as social primates. We glue together and we rub each other and we make nice and we talk and all these things. So brain science is not this reductionistic thing that, talk, does, that doesn't understand human social needs. And this level explanation, this is where it gets very complicated. This level understanding means that we have a thing called causal complexity. Say that after me. Causal complexity. So if you to ask me, why am I an addict, or how did I get this, I'm going to take a deep breath and say, that's a tricky question. Because you come into the world with brains or genes, and then you have some early experiences. And then you have some developmental processes. Maybe you get exposed to stuff. And then you have adult events. Maybe at some point, you, you, know, you get in a situation. And then you have a brain disorder called addiction. And it's very complicated to sort it out, isn't it? What's the cause? It's not even really a coherent uh, way to ask a question. That's tool two, is levels. Tool three is the iceberg. This is a version of tool one. When I'm sitting with my friend who's now abandoned me, causing hurt feelings, emotional pain, I'm going to ride that joke until it dies. So bear with me. I'm both thinking about what he's saying and what he's thinking. But our conscious minds are like the tip of an iceberg. Our conscious minds are like the tip of an iceberg. I'm not going Freudian on everybody. What that means, as far as I know, from my observation of myself, and I've spent a fair amount of time paying attention to what goes on in this thing, as far as I know, this thing is a small part of the deal. That there are forces and factors and stuff that burble up and make thoughts come up that we're just not aware of. And we're very married to this thing but the tip of the iceberg is the tip of the iceberg. We're just not always, for example, I'll tell you about a fund study funded by your tax dollars. Two uh, uh, professors went to a strip joint and the experiment that they were doing was the amount of tips that strippers got. This is your tax dollars, don't look at me. <laughs> and what they found was that when a woman, not on birth control, was at her, uh, uh, the time when her eggs released, that she got more tips. Now, how is that, do you think the men that gave more tips thought, she just ovulated? <laughs> I think it's a good time to tip more. How do women that live in the same dorm room synchronize their menses? There's so many factors that we just don't understand that influence our thoughts and feelings and choices. And that's part of being a brain scientist is understanding that iceberg. Here's the iceberg that the, that the, uh, that the uh, uh, Titanic hit. It's funny, the guy who noticed it noticed there was a red smear on it from a ship hitting it. And then the rest is history, right? So one of the hands in my two-hand model, one hand is your mind and your humanity. The other hand is under the water. You just can't know what's going on in your brain right now. You can't. It's impossible. And neither do I necessarily, but I know there's something. And I know that if I change some things about how the brain works, then I can change some things about how the mind works and how choices are made. This is the whole field of experimental psychology. We've proved beyond a reasonable doubt that if I put you in an experiment and I give you this chemical and that chemical and this chemical and expose you to this stimuli and that stimuli, I can change the choices you make and you won't be aware. That's just the data. That's why when, when a patient asks me, should I drink near beer? To me, they need a little education, with Jeff is, which Jeff is going to give them about the way the brain responds to stimuli. You have to understand how the brain responds to stimuli to understand why that's not a good idea. You've got to understand that, because a lot of this is under the ice, is under the surface. 
So for the people who are really into lifering, you can ask me, I'll send you these slides. I made up this little thing about the addict self and the, and the sober self just for fun. The funny thing is these things coexist in the same brain, right? So the same brain is kicking up sober self and addict self at different times. It's just different ways the brain is working. So in the addict self, I think that on the upper left, there's very little conscious awareness of goals or outcomes beyond the immediate future. You get rationalization because that's what human brains do. There may, be a, there, may, there may be a sense of control, but it's false. And on the underneath addict self from the bottom up, the goal is to reduce short-term distress, increase short-term pleasure, and I ignore others for the most part. That is, I'm not concerned about how my behavior uh, affects others. There's repetitive or compulsive behaviors. And down in the lower right, this is a fancy term. Please don't pay attention to it, but it's important because incentive salient circuits are the dopamine system. Everybody's heard of the dopamine system in addiction. If you are interested in addiction, you should have the word dopamine in your vocabulary because that drives a lot of the uh, behaviors of the addict self. The sober self is different. The sober self has awareness or appraisal of life-affirming goals or outcomes. That's what these guys do all day in their groups, is they ask people to reflect and think and do all those things that the addict self doesn't do in any kind of honest way, because that's just not the way that part works. So you try to engage that part. And I'm thinking, as a brain scientist, when you say you came back from group, I'm thinking, oh, down in the lower right. Your incentive salient circuits are not firing. Your prefrontal circuits are firing. It's not fun to go to meetings and think about change and all this stuff. That doesn't feel good at all. But it may help you get where you really want to go if you do those things. So if anybody wants these, I just made these for fun. Anybody like uh, Clouseau? Yeah, he, you're right. So sometimes, this, uh, this cracks me up. So Clouseau, who's this crack uh, uh, detective, is outside a bank. And he sees uh, this man with a minky. And he's accosting this man with a minky because he's practicing without a license. Behind Clouseau, there's this whole robbery going on. And he's just unaware. In fact, one of the robbers drops his bag and Clouseau says, oh, here you go. And he's accosting. So many times when I'm talking to you now, my f f false friend, many, but if you're, in, if you're in lasting recovery, I'm hearing your conscious mind talking and I'm really not listening to what you're saying, to be honest, because I'm not going to pay attention to the minky. Because behind all of this is a chaotic last couple of years, right? If you're coming in for addiction treatment, I've got this robbery going on behind, and you're saying, I don't know if I have an addiction. And I'm just, it's just the monkey. Because up here is not where the action is. The action is down here. And you have a brain disorder where when you put the alcohol molecule in, you get crazy life out. But the conscious mind is just boop, 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 That's fine, but I'm not paying attention because I'm better than Clouseau. I'm not going to pay attention to the minky. That was goal number three. Uh, uh, cognitive tool number three was the fact that the, our, our minds are like an iceberg, and what you see up here is not the whole story. Now, another great thing about groups, have you ever seen in a group that someone says, blah, 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 and everybody else in the room their, their horse manure meter goes off, right? So what is that? Not everybody shares your blind spots. So everybody's like, oh, that's horse manure. Yeah, yeah. my kids may watch this video, so I gotta watch my, my uh, okay. And how would that happen? Because that's the minky, right? Now you actually believe the horse manure, but it's horse manure, it doesn't, it doesn't fit with the robbery. Okay, tool number four. Seven tools to understand how the brain works and how I think about things. It has to do with systems and circuits. Four systems or circuits. One is dopamine. Two is the opiate system. And, and those are chemical systems in the brain. The third system is the stress system. And the fourth system is the reward system. Now, these systems operate on different levels and things. But I just want you to have these as part of your working understanding. Because when I think about how the brain works in 2016, the brain is made of circuits. We know that in studying brain. Uh, uh, that's why in 2016, if I have a patient with severe obsessive compulsive disorder who, who picks her eyebrows for six to eight hours a day and can't work and is tortured by this, and we've tried every medication and every therapy, and she's tortured. She has no life because she picks her eyebrows all day. I may refer her to a specialist center that can go in and clip one of these circuits. Because if, if it's not that, then she's going to spend her whole life driven by this, uh, uh, this malfunctioning circuit. 
right? And you can pray for her, and you can do everything you want, and I've done everything possible, and at the end of the day, that's a treatment option. So not to focus on OCD, although uh, addiction has some obsessive elements, but to share with you, when we think about the brain as scientists, we think about circuits, uh, uh, these pathways that go over and over and over and get pretty well trodden. In 2016, to understand addiction, you have to understand the central opiate system. That's because one of the medications I use blocks the opiate system. That's because my profession, physicians, have screwed up a lot of lives by overprescribing opiates. And a lot of teenagers have gotten addicted to opiates, and I don't know that we haven't caused permanent scars in their reward systems by doing that. So we own that. We're trying to clean it up. Um, unlike, uh, well, I don't want to say that. Uh, I was going to say, unlike some uh, uh, cults or cultures, we haven't done the big cover-up job and said it wasn't us. I get it. We're trying to fix it. But what everybody here needs to remember is you have an opiate system. I don't care if you're an alcoholic or an addict or sober or normie or a, a Pacific Islander. Every human mammal has an opiate system in your brain. Releases it, There's uh, circuits for opiates. One interesting thing you may want to know, don't, wor don't worry about the words. This is just to remind me. But if I put a, a, something to light up the opiate systems in your brain, I can show that when you experience emotional pain, like, like my friend caused by leaving, my brain's going to release its own opiates to make me feel a little better. Your brain is releasing opiates all the time when you have emotional pain and things. There's like this self-regulating system. This is this, uh, a, a similar thing. When you, when you think about sad events, let's say you had a loss, your opiate system activates. So this system is going on all the time in our brains. And how do you think the placebo effect works? The placebo effect. If, um, it's been shown that if you have a pain in your foot, and I have a, an, a catheter in your back, and I say, I'm going to give you a very powerful pain-relieving drug, and I give you some morphine in your back, that you're going to feel better. And if I say, I don't know if this is going to work or not, but good luck, champ that you won't have as much pain relief. Same molecule. Human beliefs work based on chemistry. So I'm only introducing all of this so you understand that the opiate system is one of the circuits involved in addiction. We know it's one of the circuits involved in alcoholics because you see those bright dots of red and the blue? This is a study I think about when I see every alcoholic. I tell them I think your brain responds differently to alcohol than mine does. I might say in a different way, your brain likes alcohol. Now, you may not because it's wrecked your life, but your brain does. What I mean is when you, when we gave these volunteers alcohol, their brain's opiate system lit up. Now, alcohol is not an opiate. I know, but remember, point one is the brain's really complicated. And so one of the things that may have to do with the genetics of alcoholism, so let's, let's think for a second. If I give you some DNA where this alcohol molecule releases a lot of internal opiates when you, get, uh, when you drink, is that person going to be more likely to develop an alcohol disorder? Yes, they are. And notice there were no supernatural concepts invoked there. This is part of the biology of the disorder. And if I block that, they may help people drink less. That's what naltrexone does. That's the opiate pathway. Another pathway, the dopamine pathway. I don't want to get too deeply into this except to say that this is the pathway that's been shown to create these weird, non-survival enhancing drives and motivation. For, uh, for substances that don't help you. And interestingly, you can activate this through uh, magnetics and other things. That's how this TMS may work. And this is the system. This is New York. This is, everybody heard that addiction hijacks the brain? What does that mean, addiction hijacks the brain? Takes over every process in the brain. Takes over every process in the brain. Can I, can I edit your sentence? I'm just going to make you sound even smarter. Are we good? How about if we said that addiction hijacks the dopamine system in your brain? You good? OK, because Jeff said it's about motivation. Guess how I can enhance people's motivation? I can enhance people's motivation by increasing dopamine in your brain. We've done experiments about it. If I give you hard math problems, whether you have ADD or not and give you Ritalin, you're going to have more motivation to work hard. Animals, when I give them dopamine stimulators, will work harder to get food. If I block, if I destroy their dopamine receptors, they, they don't get addicted to cocaine. 
So the dopamine system is one of the systems that gets hijacked. It's like the plane in this picture. Now the dopamine system is good for you because it helps motivate animals to, to find things, and it's a good thing to be motivated to do something. But when it gets hijacked, then you get a mess, right? This is a life with addiction. So the dopamine system in the brain is part of what gets hijacked. See how much smarter you can sound now? Well, the dopamine system is what gets hijacked, but it does. It was designed for one thing, and then it gets, you know, these, those planes were designed to get people safe, and then it, they got hijacked. It's a bad deal. If dopamine is artificially increased, as it is by every addictive drug, then this leads to the production of desire or motivation independently of pleasure. This phenomenon is outside the bailiwick of a lot of people who don't have addiction. They don't, how can you like something? That, how can you do something that causes you pain? Because the dopamine system got hijacked. And something that causes me, you know, so that's a way to understand this crazy behavior. I'm going to skip this slide. And I think I'm going to skip this slide too, just because I already said it. Um, and I'm going to skip this slide too. I'm just, attention to my time. Let's talk about a third disorder, a third, uh, uh, excuse me, two other systems. Reward and stress. What does that mean? What is reward and stress? This guy, George Kub, who wrote this article, is up north at Scripps, very smart fellow. So we should listen to what he says. He's been studying addiction for decades. What uh, a reward deficit and stress surfeit, add that to your SAT list, that means too much. That means that people who suffer with substance use disorders, their reward system, what makes them feel good, dopamine and opiates are a part of that, and their stress system, hormones like cortisol are a part of that, that both of those systems are dysregulated. This is kind of new. We used to just talk about the reward system. So what that means is in the process of developing addiction, the blue line is when you first start using and things feel good. And feeling good is what drives the behavior. And what people who don't work with addiction or suffer with addiction don't get, they just don't, is that what drives the behavior for the whole rest of the time is the red line. I'm trying to not feel bad. People who don't work with addiction and don't suffer with addiction don't get that. They'll say things like the person just wants to get loaded all the time. They've they obviously have never talked to a person with an addiction because that's not the drill for the most of the lifespan of the disorder. And we know that this process of the positives and the negatives is driven by events in the brain. Please don't focus on this. The clinical point is this. When I'm sitting with my, uh, my former friend here and he's saying he has an alcohol use disorder, I'm thinking, Again, your stress system may be really hot and bothered for a while based on all these cells in places that you don't care about because I got to know that. And I may offer you some medication that's been shown in clinical trials to help you with your stress system because if I say, bite the leather, Jim, and I say, hey, why don't we help you with some non-addictive, non-habit-forming medications to help your stress system chill out, you're going to do better than you are. Because bite the leather, Jim, leaves people whose stress system is oversensitive at high risk of relapse. That's why understanding brain science can be helpful. And that's why we offer some people in addiction and in recovery uh, different medications because of these different systems. OK, tool five. We're more than, half, we're more than uh, half of the way there. Another tool you need to understand how the brain works is that the brain is both plastic and static. Here's what this means. If you remember one thing. I teach you today. I've changed the way your brain is wired. Brain changes are what learning is. So that's a plastic organ. In other words, it changes. But the brain is also static. That means there are parts of it that don't change. And if I try to teach you not to breathe, and I threaten you not to breathe, and I shoot you if you do breathe, you're going to breathe because that's like a system that you can't stop, right? Thank goodness or we'd screw it up. So in some ways, the brain is like a muscle. You've heard that by people selling software to exercise your brain. But in some processes, it's like a scar. Sometimes I think of addiction like a scar. That gets to the model of chronic progressive disorder. I'm pretty sure that if someone has gone through the cycle of, of, of heroin uh, addiction and withdrawal 500 times, that their brain is not going to forget parts of that for their whole life. I'm pretty sure of that as much as I can. Now, do I have the clear science to back that up? So the idea of curing that biology, I don't know. Can I, can I build a life so that biology doesn't drive the thing? Sure. 
But do I fix it? I don't think so. I think there may be a scar. So some of the cure mentality, which is very hopeful. So speaking of scars, tattoos are scars, right? I did a little internet search to find tattoos that you wish you didn't get. Um, but tattoos always remind me, you know, my kids aren't going to get tattoos until they either pay their own way or are 25, because these are scars you can't erase. This is why we shouldn't expose kids to addictive drugs, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, because they can scar the brain. They cre create scars. So I can put an electrode in this fellow's head and tweak a part of his brain, and he can remember stuff from high school. This proves the point that memories are located in brain cells. This is a study I did with uh, 20,000 uh, people's reports of their childhood, merely to make the point. So very quickly, people in the blue are patients uh, um, in treatment for uh, mental health problems. People in red are not. And going down the line are how much childhood trauma have you had. You'll notice that when you get no childhood trauma, more people in the community had no childhood trauma than, uh, than people who were in treatment for uh, uh, brain-based disorders. But then when you get to moderate and severe amounts of childhood trauma, suddenly the vast majority are in treatment for a brain-based disorder. So one of the reasons that you want to understand that, that uh, the brain is not completely plastic is if I see you and you tell me you had a very rough childhood, what I think in my mind is those experiences created a little scar in your brain. That doesn't mean you can't have a life and be happy and yada, yada, yada. But that created a little scar in your brain. We know that. We call them limbic scars. So suddenly, we have an organ that responds to uh, experiences by making memories. And we know that one of the places that these memories may get made in the, is in the amygdala. That's the stress center of your brain. And this is a study using the childhood trauma scale. And what they did was they put people in the scanner, and they showed them uh, scary and mad faces. And people who had more childhood trauma, their brains were more active when they saw scary or mad faces than people who had less trauma. So people's brains change based on their experiences. That's the plastic part. Giving patients morphine for a month changes their brain. We all know this after 10 years in the field. So exposure to opiates changes your brain. Um, and I'm actually just conscious of our time. I'm going to skip this experiment, but tell me to talk about it later. But I'm not just talking about giving you medicine, because if, if Jeff teaches you meditation, that changes your brain. This is a study on changes in brain circuits by people who practice meditation. You don't get it after one trial. But if you practice for 30 days, your brain's different. Let's go to rule number six. So when you're thinking about the brain, we're almost home. When you're thinking about the brain, I want you to think about dogs. Here's two ways that dogs can teach you about the brain. A, dogs are very social mammals, and so are humans. So when someone's talking about doing recovery solamente, it probably won't work, not because 12 steps says it, but because humans are social creatures. The second reason I think about dogs, this is going to scare everybody. So let me show you some pictures of dogs. These are African wild dogs. Notice that they, they're, they're together at the trough. Some of the brain biology of sociali sociality is caused by oxytocin. If you want me to talk for an hour on that, I could. But we didn't know this 10 years ago. Now we do. Um, and interestingly, oxytocin is part of what makes dogs bond with us. But let me just uh, go on to the following picture. I'm sorry, this picture. So when I talk to you and you're in, this, in my recovery program, I'm thinking of you like a dog in this way. All of these dogs are cousins, right? The, 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 the species name is what? Anybody dog? Canis, Canis what? Familiaris. Right? Canis familiaris. They're all cousins. Now, do they look pretty different? Do they act pretty different? These guys are cousins. Check that out. How is that possible? So just like dogs differ in body size, they differ in behavior. And are there different kinds of people in the world? And what do we call the kind of dog you are? We call that your personality, right? Or your temperament. Or I call it the way you're wired. Some people are outgoing. Some people are shy. Some people are this. Some people are that. But we're all cousins if, you know, homo habilis or homo whatever you call you, but we're all the same species. And part of those differences are driven by differences in brain biology. So dogs can teach us something about the brain. And this is a big study over the whole world that talked about the fact that all over the world, humans have certain ways they're wired. Jeff, you do personality testing in the program, right? The reason I'm interested in your personality is because that may help me direct you in some different ways and help you understand 
how you roll through the world and how that may help your recovery. And that's, dr again, driven by brain biology. Um, you'll notice, bring back Sisyphus, he's pushing the rock alone. That's probably not the best way to push the rock. It's just less likely to be helpful because of brain biology and because we're a, a very social and evolved species. Uh, this little guy doesn't survive very long if he doesn't hang on. It's just wired into his brain. When he falls, he loves his mom, his dopamine system goes. If he falls off, his stress system's going, and he's going to hang on to his mom and all the big people his whole life. This is why Buddha's wrong. I'm poking on Buddha today. He wouldn't mind. He's a chill guy. <laughs> he says the root of suffering is attachment. And I know he's not talking about like attachment theory and love and all that stuff, but I am. Because one of the roots of suffering as a human mammal is not attachment, but is isolation. When you isolate monkeys, keep them away from their moms, and they can't have normal social interaction, just think about this for a minute. They can't mate. They're vicious. They fight to the death, dismembering opponents. It sounds like that one kind of fighting that, uh, you know, yeah. They self-mutilate, and they can't mate. So human mammals, we're primates, human mammals don't do well in isolation. So when Jeff's talking about the reason meetings are important, you can go, but I don't need to go supernatural. I can say, we're a social species. We just don't do well alone. We don't bear pain well alone. And this is from Kurtz Vonnegut's son, who has uh, apparently suffered with a mental illness and became a pediatrician. We're here to uh, get each other through this thing, whatever it is. It's a nice way to think about what our job is on this little rock. Last topic, and then we'll take some questions. So we went through six tools so far. The seventh tool for understanding how the brain works is language. Words matter. And remember the BDMA? Is that a new designer drug? What's the BDMA? Thank you. The brain disease model of addiction. Everyone here is going to know so much more about that than you did when you started. So words matter. So if I say addiction is a brain disease, Art could come back and say, but Kai, some, the, Nature is one of the top journals in science. Somebody said substance abuse cannot be divorced from its social, psychological, cultural, political, legal, and environmental context. It's not simply brain malfunction. That's true. I agree with that. Right? So if I say addiction is just a brain disease, then I've created a linguistic problem. If I say the only coherent way to treat addiction is with medication, I've created a problem. Because the brain is this co very complicated organ. So is, now addiction is also a molecular problem because we're made of molecules, right? And it's a cellular problem because we're made of cells. But are those levels of understanding that reduce suffering, are they helpful? Are they humane? And is it humane if you talk about addiction as a spiritual problem or a moral problem? Is that helpful? Is it humane? I'm not going to get into whether it's right. Is it helpful to think about addiction as a moral problem? A lot of the data says no, but it's tricky. I'll tell you why that is in a minute. So here's an interesting study talking about language and our understanding of ourselves. People who read a neuroscience-based explanation or were educated in neuroscience, that's everybody here now, found transgressors less brain, br blameworthy and were less punitive. I think they showed this to judges. So if I talk about the brain, judges are less likely to be punitive. But then, here's another study where I take people with depression, I give them a cheek swab, and it's bogus, and I say you have a serotonin deficiency. And if I said that your depression was from a serotonin deficiency, you were less optimistic about recovery, less confident in your ability to regulate negative moods, and you were more likely to value medication. And it encouraged a passive approach to treatment. So there is a downside to, to what I'm saying. If I say, you know, your addiction is a chemical problem, we need some chemicals to fix it, it's just a brain problem. And you then take a passive approach to treatment and just want your chemistry adjusted. That's not going to work well. So that is not what I'm saying, that this is just a brain disorder that's solved by biology, uh, by uh, uh, chemical biology. And also clinicians who had biologic models had less empathy for their patients. That's why I keep in mind that you're a guy with a kid and family and love and goals and all this stuff. Because if I just think, your serotonin is imbalanced, let me check the level and adjust it, <laughs> I won't have the empathy for you that's critical for treatment. So the brain disease model, because this is where you get, if you stick, have an a, a absurd kind of pornographic brain-based model, is there's a, there's a chemical solution for this complex disorder. This is a Viagra dispenser. There's not an easy chemical solution for the, uh, the problem of addiction. But there are chemistries that certainly help a lot. 
So the benefits of a brain disease model of addiction, A, people seek treatment more. That's nice. There's less stigma. There's uh, uh, less, people go to prison less. Uh, we've seen that change in society. It's the foundation for the medical model. If, if it's not a brain disorder, why would I give you a chemical that's going to change the way your brain works? It's got to be. Less focus on the morality and judgment and hellfire and all that good stuff. And there's less focus on willpower, which is good because, you know, willpower is a, a brain thing. But there's downsides to the brain disease model. It can be disempowering if you don't feel like you have personal control. You can focus on medical treatment, and we, we see that all the time. Adjust my meds and I'll be well. It posits that addiction is incurable and untreatable. I don't know that it's curable, but it certainly is treatable. And people who endorse this model take less responsibility. So, so I'm, I'm not saying that this brain model is like the holy grail and, and uh, go in peace. I'm saying this is a coherent, rational, scientific model, but there are some downsides. Because ultimately, the brain is this very complex, multicolored place. The brain disease model of addiction is not a black or white thing. It encompasses a huge amount of different concepts, which I just hit you like with a fire hose. The seven tools that I talked about in terms of understanding how the brain works. So we talked about one hand clapping, which is that all our thoughts and feelings come from the brain. If you have any debates about that, please see me. I don't think that's a, 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 a statement that has much, needs much expansion. We talked about levels from the gene to circuits to the single person to society. That's a way to think about the brain. The iceberg says that a lot of the stuff that goes on in here we're not aware of. There's modules and circuits, dopamine, opiates, stress, and reward. And then plastic and static. You can change your brain with learning and things, but then things like child abuse can scar the brain. I talked about the fact that I think about you like a dog sometimes because we're a very social species. And then there's this uniqueness in us that needs explanation. And lastly, that language matters and that the way you talk about a disorder with people and the way you talk about people with a disorder changes things in an important way. This is to remind me that this guy's playing tennis in, at uh, 1245, and that's why I'm going to entertain questions and then take my leave of you. Um, but he's one of my addictions, um, and um, so, that, uh, so I don't get all choked up and teary uh, because he's a great uh, one of my blessings in life. Let me see if there's any questions. Am I aware of any brain effects of some of the somatic therapies, like EMDR and what else? Brain spotting, I don't know about, but, if you, but you could describe it. But here's what it comes down to. That's why I, this model actually is a nice backstop for me. Effective therapy changes the brain. If there's a therapy that changes the brain, it must have an impact on a brain disorder like addiction. What's the extent of the impact and how would that play out and blah, 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 blah. But there's no way around that, that idea. So, um, so, so that's the science of it. And what you'd have to do, if, since I'm a, you'd have to design an experiment and see, it wouldn't surprise me if in a pop, certain population, if EMDR didn't help them manage their substance use disorders better. Wouldn't surprise me at all. Because I think EMDR, it, EMDR is recognized in an effective therapy, which means it changes the brain. And you know, if you've got awful memories burbling up from your, from your unconscious, I gotta imagine that's not real productive for recovery. Any other questions? Please don't misquote me. TMS is not prime time for addiction. I'm trying to give you a little glance into the future. TMS is as different from ECT as touching a, uh, one of those old square batteries. Remember those back in the day when we had batteries? Uh, is from uh, getting uh, you know, defibrillated. The energy in, the, in ECT is tremendous. TMS, transcranial magnetic simulation, is just a technique. You saw, the, remember the coil? where we use uh, mag magnetism to change the electricity in your brain. So they both deal with electricity, but when uh, getting, uh, getting TMS is like getting your hair cut. You're awake, you're alert, you go in, you leave. It's a, it's a non-event. Uh, um, uh, ECT requires sedation, and, you know, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a powerful but very different treatment. But they both deal with the brain as an electrical organ, because the brain's an electrical organ. You get struck by lightning, your brain is going to have a, a response to that. And there are a lot of new and growing therapies that get into the brain through electricity. So you can put an electrode here and put electrodes here and keep your eyes on it. It's, it's up and coming, but you know, we need research. I find that most people have a vastly uh, a primitive understanding of the way the brain works and what that means for behavior and things. I just find that, the, I mean, every person I talk to just has tremendous, now, now that's not an, casting aspersions. 
on anybody or anything, but I think if, if you really drilled down and help, you know, and help people think and introspect, um, so uh, teaching people what we already know would be fantastic. You know how, how long after hand washing was discovered to reduce infections it got implemented? It was like decades. So we didn't need more ideas about hand washing science. We need people to start washing their hands, you know. Um, um, then uh, aside from that, um, I don't know, there's a lot of exciting stuff. You know, not, non, um, non, non, uh, um, uh, well, <laughs> again, to be very honest, teaching because uh, look at, we're going to do an experiment in, in California where we're going to make uh, an, uh, a, a drug that can clearly cause addiction uh, much more available. And, you know, so, um, so uh, the, we'll see what the neuroscience, how the neuroscience of that plays out. So we know a lot already. And, uh, and, 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 and the, when people have a, a broken model of what, what real substance use disorders actually are, I find that to be the most. So, um, but let me, let me let that percolate, and I'll see if I come up with something really sexier than that. Yeah, is medication addicted treatment something I see con continuing through a person's life? That's a great question. So let me first say, funny, um, it's interesting we have to call it medication addicted tre add uh, assisted treatment rather than just treatment. If you get your depression treated, does that specify whether it's medication or therapy or, or TMS? Or, so it's funny, even in the words, we say, oh, it's medication. Oh, that's like this other thing rather than, if you go in the hospital for treatment of your heart problem, it might be medicine, it might be physical therapy, but they don't say, oh, you're going to get medication. So I'm just pointing that out because addiction specialists, it bothers us. That, that in this brain disorder, now all of a sudden, oh, medication-assisted treatment. But anyway. Um, and keep in mind, one of the medication assisted treatments is an opiate blocker. It's, we recommend it's continued as long as the patient and the, the psychiatrist think that it's in their best interest. Now, if, if I'm going to give you some money to do a study, this is how, you'd, this is how I'd answer the question. I'm going to give you some money to do a study. You, uh, um, you think I'm going to fund your study for 10 years? No. A year? Maybe. But that's it. So we don't know for sure. I mean, I have clinical experience treating patients for years and years and years. And methadone, anybody know or heard of somebody who's been on methadone and had a life for decades? Okay, so that's a natural experiment in medication-assisted treatment. And we know in studying methadone that people go along and some, some cultures give people heroin. You know, I mean, that's what they do in Portugal. But, but the point is, um, um, the other piece that I bring to bear that you now have in your mind, is it possible that opiate dependence is a scar? It's possible. And if somebody has a seizure disorder, a scar in their brain, they get a car injury, they have a scar in their brain that makes abnormal discharge and they're going to have a seizure, when do I recommend they go off medicine? I don't. You, you could, but then you're likely to have a seizure. So it's possible that for some people, medication-assisted treatment may be long-term, but we just don't have the data because 10, 20-year studies is just like, right, it's really hard to do. Um, another, one other example. Treatment-resistant depression. You've had three miserable depressions where you've been suicidal. When do I recommend you go off medication? Never. Why not? Because you feel better. Because the research we've done shows that your chances of going for 10 years and not getting morbidly depressed is like 2%. You can play those odds, but I wouldn't recommend it. So there are other brain disorders already where chronic medical treatment is the standard, and no one says, you know, you haven't had a seizure in a year, John, go off your meds. We just don't think of it that way. That's why I'm really passionate about teaching about brain-based problems because nobody says that. Nobody says to a patient with bipolar, taper off your lithium, you've been doing fine. I'm evaluating right now uh, um, uh, a professional who, who has been on lithium for 10 years, doing great. Am I going to recommend? And he, he was not doing great before. Am I going to recommend? He just tapers off because uh, actually, no, I'm not. That'd be ludicrous. So why do we think about addiction differently? Because our models may not fit with standard neuroscience. Other questions? Great question. So um, have they changed their brain if they recover from their addictive disorder? Yeah. Yeah, they're making different choices. They're rolling through the world differently. They're avoiding certain things. That's all brain stuff. Uh, and if they did that, again, if, if they did that and they're rocking and having a life and loving and working, go for it, champ. However you got there. I'm not, you know, if it's purple nail polish, Keep, keep rolling. But the, you, your question had a second part that was more difficult. Do you think there's a placebo oh, placebo. Effect? 
let me, the placebo effect is this. Human beliefs and expectations change brain activity. So do person's beliefs and expectations change the way they roll through the world and their, yes. I hope that someone with an addictive disorder has a belief that if they put that molecule in, they're gonna get bad life out. And will that belief change the way they roll through the world? Of course it will. Now, does that live somewhere in, the, in here? Yeah, it must. Can I explain it? Not well. So beliefs are powerful. Uh, um, you know, they, that's what took all the people in Heaven's Gate away, right? Beliefs are powerful. People blow up plane, uh, buildings for beliefs. They're powerful stuff. Great question. We are with TMS where we were back in the day when we, there was a day once where what we had was Thorazine and Imipramine. That's where we are with TMS. And, and, and in fact, we still use the same dumb names for medicines we used then. So it's at the infancy. Um, 20 years ago, I was working with a psychiatrist in Israel who's kind of farting around with TMS. So science, technology has a long lifespan. We're just not there yet. Um, uh, but are people talking about it? You bet your boots they are. Um, I just, there's not enough great, good data. Yeah. There was an, uh, yes, sir. Dysthymia is chronic low mood. Some people have that. M they must. I mean, you know, if someone can have chronic high mood and someone can have normal mood, then chronic low mood. The best treatments for chronic low mood are um, antidepressants and mindfulness-based uh, cognitive therapy. That's my understanding. Same thing is for depression. So it's, a, it's, it's thought of as a form of chronic low-grade depression, just like you can have pre-diabetes. Um, yeah. Yes, sir. I love it. See, I hooked your incentive salient system. No, I did. I'm not joking. Interest in learning is, is part of the incentive salient system. So um, I would recommend SAMHSA and SAMHSA's website. Uh, uh, your tax dollars are paid for the, uh, uh, anything you can get written by Nora Volkow, who's like this dominatrix of neuroscience. I mean, she's unbelievable. Um, you can send me an email. I probably, I mean, I could send you uh, enough uh, information to, uh, but, uh, but you know, that, that, that might clog our, our server. But the, some of the, some of the uh, government-sponsored uh, websites um, um, have tons of information. Um, uh, the, the video, Pleasure Unwoven, is pretty good. Um, a lot of what, uh, what I talked about today is an accretion of like 30 years of obsession. Um, but, um, but again, if you wanted to email me, I can, you know, I can feed you books until we both blow off this place. You know, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, because addiction neuroscience actually captures almost the whole deal. One of my passions about addiction is if you really get addiction, you can kind of understand how this thing works, I think. It's a pretty all-encompassing disorder. Because like I mentioned, my son, who I love, I think you know, love is basically a, a good manifestation of the addiction uh, circuitry. But don't quote me. It reminds me of a, of a concept that I hold actually very near, which is the human brain was actually not designed to figure out how the human brain works. <laughs> um, um, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, there's a quote that we're tied to a language that makes up in obscurity what it lacks in precision or something like. So language is going to fall short when describing really complex processes. So it's possible that neither word is right or that, you know, sometimes it's just hard to get things just right. If you uh, take a writing course and try to describe smells, you're going to have a hell of a time because our language just doesn't wrap around that too well. So. You know, we just got off all fours not too long ago and went from grunts to, to syllables. So, you know, it wouldn't surprise me that it's hard to find a word that fits your understanding of this complex process precisely. You know, we're, we're, it's a work in progress. The, what, the, what the experiment I showed is more strongly. Because, I mean, you, if you talk to other people, alcohol feels good. For some people, I think it feels real good. And what we know about the brain is if I, so let's say I take someone with childhood trauma and someone without. If I, let's say you, you have it and you don't. If I poke you in the foot, your amygdala is going to light up. But his amygdala is going to light up more. So stimuli can have significant, that's part of individual differences. Part of what makes a, a Labrador run up and jump on you is his brain gets lit up with people. And if you're in Akita, you know those stuffy Japanese dogs? 
Like they're going to glance at you. So their brains, the Akeda notices you, but he doesn't do, but the lab is like all over you. So the lab is like the alcoholic and you know, so that, that's the way. <laughs> that's why the naltrexone works when it does, but it doesn't work for everybody. And our understanding of the, the unique biology of addiction is just still primitive. I'm conscious that some people have been sitting for uh, 50, uh, 66 minutes, 76 minutes. So let me just thank everyone for your rapt attention. I will be here for questions. But for those of you who are patiently gritting your teeth, uh, thank you. And if, again, I'm here for questions.